this morning in John chapter 5, we're talking about a healing that Jesus did at the Pool of Bethesda. And you know what? I was there this last Wednesday. And so how crazy would it be if I didn't show a little bit of video? So here's two minutes of video of our guide, Edo Kenyon, talking about what's there at the Pool of Bethesda. You know, the quality's not that great, but it gives you a little bit of feel. Okay, hit it. We're talking about two double pools, okay? Well, let's say two pools, double pools. That's the southern one that you can see. It's a kind of a corner down there that was 150 by 180 and uh, about uh, 30 feet uh, deep. There was a dike and we can see that dike here straight ahead where the rail is. That was the border between the Norton Pool that was 150 and 150 and 30 feet deep. They were filled up by aqueducts that uh, were built around us collecting rainwater into the pools and from the pools waterways that uh, linked the pool to the Temple Mount area where there was one huge cistern beneath the altar that was providing the water to wash the sacrifices, the blood of the sacrifices from uh, the uh, altar. Now, there was a tradition well known, that's why it was known as the House of Mercy, that uh, needed people, poor and paralytic, blind, will come over here. Why? One, for the tradition of uh, the angel that came to stir, to stir the water and those who managed to get during that time were healed, or the more basic one, that this was on the way to the temple. And any pilgrim, as one of the 613 Jewish law, says help, support, donate the needed, will help those that were here by the pool. Wow. All right, Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we get to talk about something that many in our group here this morning, we actually saw it with our own eyes this last Wednesday. It just reminds us, Lord, that we are not following uh, cunningly devised fables or made-up stories, but real things that happen to real people. So speak to us now, Lord, through these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. John chapter 5, beginning now at verse 1, where we read, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. In John chapter 5, we begin, essentially, a new section within the Gospel of John. The first four chapters were basically revealing to us God the Son, and in many different ways, God introduced Jesus Christ to us through those first four chapters of John. He's revealed as this, he's revealed as that, and in a full way, he's revealed unto us in those first four chapters. Now, beginning with John chapter 5, we enter into a whole new section of the Gospel of John, that will last for several chapters. And the main theme is not the revelation of the Son, it's opposition to the Son of God. Opposition by the world, opposition by the religious leaders. Now, it might sound strange to us, but Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, a sinless man, full of love, full of truth, full of goodness, he was opposed. And he was opposed again and again by oftentimes those who just should have accepted him. And so that's going to be our larger theme through the next several months as we make our way through this section of the Gospel of John, and we're going to focus in on this particular story this morning. It begins, verse 1, where it says, there was a feast of the Jews. We don't know what feast it was. Many commentators suppose it was Passover, others Pentecost. We don't know exactly, but it's not particularly relevant to our story which particular feast it was. But at this feast, there were a large number of people gathered around. Did you see it there in verse 2? a pool which is called in Beth Hebrew Bethesda. Now that pool, again, has been excavated in this area just to the north of the temple area, and it's found to have five porches, just as the biblical text described that it had. 
And this was a place where many people gathered around, and they gathered because they awaited healing. Did you notice what it said starting at verse 3? It says, in these, in other words, in these porches, lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed. Can you get that idea in your mind? Picture two great big outdoor pools with covered porches. There's sort of awnings over it where people can find a little bit of shade in the midst of the hot day sun. And there spread out across every square inch of that ground is nothing but blind people, sick people, paralyzed people, afflicted people lying all about. And what are they waiting for? Well, I'm going to read from the middle of verse 3 to the end of verse 4, but you have to follow me on this. What we read here is we read, middle of verse 3, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, some of you are looking at me kind of quizzically because you say, David, The middle of verse 3 and all of verse 4, it's not in my Bible. What's going on with that? Well, friends, this is a little section in the Gospel of John, which it seems was not in the very earliest manuscripts, and so it sticks out a little bit like a sore thumb. It seems that probably this was a little notation made on the side of the text, perhaps by somebody who was copying it, and then inadvertently it found its way into the text, but it found its way in pretty early on. It's adding information, which essentially we have from verse 7 later on, where one of the men around that pool will explain. So I don't want you to be surprised or alarmed if that particular verse is not in your Bible, but I just want you to understand what it says, because the essential truth of it is communicated to us in verse 7 as well. There was the thought, there was the legend, there was the feeling that around this pool of Bethesda, at certain times, now by the way, when it says at certain times, I believe what it meant there was at feast times. In other words, at Passover, at Pentecost, there would be hundreds of sick, blind, paralyzed, afflicted people who would gather around that particular pool waiting for the stirring of the waters. What was the stirring of the waters? Well, people wonder. Maybe it was true that an invisible angel came down and stirred up the waters and people were healed. Maybe that's true. Maybe it was true that instead it was just sort of an artesian spring, and you know how a spring can kind of send up bubbles from the midst? Maybe that's what they interpreted to be, some kind of miraculous stirring of the waters. But friends, it was widely believed that if you were sick or paralyzed or afflicted, and if you were by that pool and the waters were stirred, if you were the first one in the pool, you would be healed. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if they had something like that today, how many people would gather around? But can you imagine in an age before they had hospitals, before they had proper doctors, before they had medical care and all the rest, how many people would be crowded around and how desperate they would be not only to be there, but to be the first one in the water. That was the situation at the pool of Bethesda. And it all happened at a certain time. Now, it's a fascinating question to bring up, and I can't go into it in great depth. Was this real or not? Were there people really healed at the pool of Bethesda or not by the stirring of the waters and being the first ones in? And let me give you a very categorical, confident, I don't know. Maybe they were. You know, sometimes God does very unusual miracles in the Bible. I mean, when you look in the pages of the Old Testament, you have some people who were healed by a purified pot of stew in 2 Kings. You have a man named Naaman who was healed by washing in the Jordan River. You have somebody who was healed by touching the bones of a dead prophet. You have some people healed in the New Testament when the shadow of Peter comes upon them. You have other people healed in the New Testament when they touch the sweat bands of the Apostle Paul. Folks, that's weird. But sometimes strange, unexplainable things happen. So I don't put it outside the realm of possibility that people were actually healed when they came into the water. But it's also possible, you and I know this, that it was just a superstition, that it was just something that people thought in a very hopeful way. And maybe some people walked away to their feeling better because of a jolt of adrenaline that came into their body. Maybe it was a placebo effect. We don't really know if people were genuinely healed at the pool, but it doesn't even really matter for the particular account here. What matters is that people thought they would be healed. And that was true. 
There they are, all gathered around the pool, waiting for the stirring of the water, waiting for a bubble to come up, waiting for some reason to dive in and to say, I was the first, and I will be healed. And in the midst of that, look at what happens in verse 5, right here we read. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? There's one guy there. He's there for 38 years. Now, I don't believe that he sat at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. Again, in my understanding of this, the idea that there was power for healing at the pool of Bethesda was connected with a certain time, as it indicates in verse 4. So in other words, people would gather around there at feast time. But at feast time, you can imagine that the pool of Bethesda was jam-packed. And that man was there, having been afflicted by his paralysis for 38 years. Now, in the text we're going to take a look at next week, we're going to find that there's reason to believe that this man became paralyzed when he was a teenager or maybe a young adult. So this guy's older. He's 50, 60 years old maybe. And can you just imagine how this man looked, how weary he looks, how tired he looks, how hopeless he looks. Because there he is come at another feast time for the pool of Bethesda, waiting to get into the water first, and he feels like there's no way that he can be the first one there. When who comes upon him? We read it right there in verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there. Now friends, this is kind of mind-blowing to me. There are probably hundreds of sick and afflicted people lying all around the pool of Bethesda. And you know what? Jesus didn't start a healing crusade right then. Jesus didn't go through one by one through the line, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed. He didn't do anything like that. He went up to one man, a man who wasn't even looking for Jesus, a man who didn't even know who Jesus was. And Jesus walks up to this one man and he says those words, do you want to be made well? Now, I tell you, as I picture this in my mind, and again, I want to make sure that I'm not imposing something on the text, but I tell you, I can make a pretty good movie of this particular scene. And as I picture this in my mind, Jesus walks up and says this to the man, as the waters have been stirred and as people are diving into the water. Can you imagine the commotion? And can you imagine how this man feels? Utterly paralyzed. There's nobody to help him in the water. And he looks at everybody else diving in. He feels the noise, the excitement of all these people. Maybe I have it. Maybe today's my day. Maybe today's my day to receive something from God. And this man says, I will never get it. It's not my day today. Everybody else gets what they need from God, but not me. There's nobody here to help me out. Do you want to be made well, Jesus asked him. By the way, that was a very sincere question. You might think it was a stupid question. You know, in the ancient world, and some people would say in a modern world, there's people who can make a pretty good living begging. And this man had the advantage of having a genuine affliction. And maybe he was one of those people who had just been so long in his condition that by now it's all he knew. He couldn't even remember what it was like before his 38 years of affliction. He couldn't even remember what it was like. And he had so settled into his afflicted life that that's all he could live with. It's all that he could deal with. Friends, you've probably met people like that. Maybe just a touch, you recognize some of yourself in there. You are more comfortable in your affliction than being set free. There's something about it that gnaws at you. You you know that it's not right, but yet you find yourself in that exact place. You see, Jesus dealt with this man who as much as his legs were withered, it's entirely likely that his heart was withered as well. And he just couldn't muster up any strength to believe God that anything could be different at all. Therefore, Jesus comes to this man and makes an honest appeal of faith where he simply asks him, do you want to be made well? Look at the man's response in verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. 
Sir, there's nobody here to help me into the pool. Maybe other people around the pool of Bethesda had helpers. Maybe other people didn't need helpers. Maybe their affliction was of a such where they could see when the waters would stir and they could get themselves in the water. But when everybody's diving into the pool, this man's out on the outskirts and feels, feels like he's never going to be the one to receive what he needs from God. He explains to Jesus, listen, Jesus, I want to be made well, but it's impossible. Jesus, don't you know how it works here at the pool of Bethesda? To get what you need at this pool, you've got to be the first one in the water. That's how it works here. And you see, because it's impossible for me to be the first one in the water, I don't see how I can ever be healed. Now, what's interesting about this man was the way that he seemed to have a combined hope with hopelessness. Did he have hope? Well, certainly he had some hope. He wouldn't be there at the pool of Bethesda unless he had some hope. But he had hope, but he also had a large degree of hopelessness. Because he says, here I am. I had enough hope to take the trouble to get out here to the pool of Bethesda, but nothing good is going to happen to me here. His hope was limited because the only way that he could think that God could meet his need was in the way that everybody else thought it was. This is how he thought. He said, I have to get into the water and I have to get into it first. That's how it works. Friends, don't you realize that people think the same way today? They have a vague hope that something can be better. At the same time, they have a hopelessness because they think that there's only one way that it can happen. Let me give you an example. You know, there's a lot of people in the world today that they really long for, and I'll just say it, money. They ache for it. I wouldn't doubt that there's a lot of people in this room, you honestly believe, and I'm not trying to criticize you for this belief, I'm just trying to speak to it, you honestly believe that, you know what, if I had more money, a lot of problems in my life would go away. My life would be much, much better if I had more money. Okay, great, I understand that, I get that. But do you realize that what you're really hoping for when you're wanting money is you want security in your life? That's what you're looking for. You're looking for some security. You don't want to have to sweat it week to week about how you're going to be provided for. You don't have to sweat it paycheck to paycheck and hope that somehow you can scrape by. You see, your desire for money is really a desire for security. This man thought, I desire to get into the water first. But what did he really want? He really wanted to be healed. And if there was a way that he could be healed without getting into the water first, don't you think he'd be interested in it? Friends, if there's a way that you could find true security and contentment in your life without necessarily having more money, wouldn't you be interested in that? May I introduce you to Jesus Christ? Isn't it wonderful? How Jesus says, you know what? Your root need in your life is for security. It's for safety. It's to know that you don't have to sweat it it week to week. Friends, here's the deal. You think that what you really need is more money. No, what you need is that confidence and contentment in Jesus as your provider. But you see, we get locked into thinking that it only has to be one way that this can be fixed in my life. And it's as if Jesus wants to draw back the curtain and say, I got ways to provide and to work in your life that you never even dreamed of. Would you please look to me? That's what he's trying to stir up in this man. So he asks him, do you want to be made well? Do you really want to be made well? Do you want to be lifted out of your miserable condition? And the man said, I can't, because he was only thinking that God could do it in one particular way. Well, what does Jesus do in the midst of this hopeless situation? I love what he says. Did you see it there in verse 8? Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Doesn't Jesus know the guy's paralyzed? Doesn't Jesus know that this is why he's at the pool of Bethesda? It's like, Jesus, wake up, Jesus. If it was as simple as you say, wouldn't have this man done it a long time ago? No, because there's something different about this day at the pool of Bethesda. And what's different about this day at the pool of Bethesda isn't that Jesus is going to put this guy first in line. Isn't that Jesus is going to have this guy get in the water first when the angel stirs water? That's not at all. What's different is that the Son of God is there to meet this man's need at the pool of Bethesda. And when the Son of God speaks, it's different. You or I, in who we are, on our own authority, we could say to that man a thousand times over, rise, take up your bed and walk, and it would be no good. But when the Son of God says it, it's entirely different, isn't it? 
When Jesus Christ comes and when he speaks to the situation and he says to a man whose legs are dead, rise, take up your bed and walk, there is something inherently powerful in those words that gives that man the ability to do it. You see, Jesus told the man to do something that he could not do. It was impossible for him to rise, impossible for him to take up his bed, impossible for him to walk, but Jesus challenged that man I want you to believe me for the impossible right now. By the way, may I mention that when he says take up your bed and walk, he's not talking about one of those nice little twin bed dough mattress kind of things. It's not like the guy just got back from Ikea and he's got the little framed bed and all that. I mean, that would be quite a miracle to see a guy who's you know, walking around with a big bed on his back. No, that's not at all. It was kind of a bed mat. Something a little bit bigger than what we would think of a pad that someone would sleep on. So a straw mat, maybe. It's not huge, but it's something. Now, this is what I want you to notice. When Jesus said to the man, rise, he told him to do two things. Rise, pick up your bed, and walk. To do those three things. Don't you think that the man's first reaction would simply to say, I can't do that. Why should I even try? Friends, there was something wonderful at that moment that prompted the man to say, why not? Why not do it? Why not believe the word of Jesus? If this man tells me to do it, I will try. And Jesus guided the man towards a response of faith. You know, I just want you to understand that that man at that moment had a choice to make, didn't he? He had a choice to make. I'm either going to believe the word that this man speaks to me, or I'm not going to believe it. I'm either going to try to do what he tells me to do, or I'm not going to try. There was a battle right at that moment between fear and unbelief, and Jesus appealed to the man to believe on him, where at that moment, unbelief would have said, hey, listen, Jesus, I can't be healed unless I get into the water. You got to get the water into this whole act. But faith would say, Jesus can heal me any way he wants to. Unbelief would say, I've, that bed has carried me for 38 years. But faith would say, Jesus told me that now it's time for me to carry that bed instead of the bed carrying me. Now, unbelief would say, many people at this pool are only temporarily better because of a placebo or a shot of adrenaline. But no, faith would say, if I can carry my bed like he commanded me to, then I am really healed. It's not just an illusion. And friends, I want you to understand that at this moment, when he was confronted with this choice of faith, this man had only one thing going for him, and that was the response of faith to the word of Jesus. Think about it. This man was not seeking Jesus. Jesus sought him. This man didn't have a lot of hope. This man doesn't seem to be an especially spiritual man. And by the way, if I can point out, and we're going to take a look at this next week, this man wasn't even an especially good man. What we're going to take a look at at verse 14 next week, it implies that this man was in the condition he was in because of some sin in his life. Worse yet, this man, and we'll see it next week, this man was about ready to rat Jesus out to the religious authorities. He's not that great a man. It's not because he's so wonderful. But simply because he believes the word of Jesus at this moment, when Jesus asked him to believe and respond, he did. And that made all the difference. So can you imagine the tension in that moment? Jesus says to him, verse 8, rise, take up your bed and walk. And then verse 9, and immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Never was there a day beside the pool of Bethesda like that. You know, I can imagine at the moment Jesus came up to the man, people were diving into the water. They're wet. They're splashing. Everybody's thinking, I got it. I got it. I got it. And everybody's wondering, did I get healed? Did I get healed? And again, friends, I can't really tell you whether it was real or whether it was just a superstition. It doesn't really matter for the sake of our story. But I will tell you this. 
there was one man for sure who walked away from there healed. And it was the man who believed on the word of Jesus. Jesus told him, rise, pick up your bed and walk. And he said, okay, even though I've never thought that I could do this, I will do this. And verse 9 tells us, immediately the man was made well. This happened as he responded in faith to what Jesus told him to do. Even though a moment before this, it was impossible for him to do it. And friend, the fact of his healing was confirmed that not only did he have the strength to stand up and the strength to walk, but to actually pick up that mat that he had been laying on and to carry it out of there. This man was genuinely healed. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? He didn't ask questions. He didn't debate with Jesus. He just did what Jesus told him to do. And friends, many times in the Gospel of John and in the other Gospels, you find these ways that Jesus healed people. And you know one of the things that amazes me about the New Testament is the variety of ways that Jesus healed people. There was no one technique. When you take a look at the New Testament, People are healed in many different ways. Uh, for example, we know from the book of James that the elders of the church may anoint someone with oil and pray for them and they may be healed. But we're also told in the book of Mark that God's people can lay hands on one another in prayer and ask God for healing and people may be healed that way. We know from 1 Corinthians 12 that God may grant somebody a gift of healing, either that they receive that gift to be healed or they receive it to impart a healing to somebody else. We know in Matthew chapter 9 that God may grant healing in response to the faith of the person who wants to be healed. But we also know from Mark and from Matthew chapter 8 that God may grant healing in response to the faith of someone else who prays for someone else to be healed. And we know also that God may heal through medical treatment. That's in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and James chapter 5 and in Luke chapter 10. You know, one of the things that fascinates me is we find that God heals in so many different ways because I don't think God wants anybody down to a formula. To say, okay, you want your healing from God? Do A, B, and C, and guaranteed you got it. Friends, God doesn't like working according to those kind of formulas. God isn't like a vending machine where you put your quarters in and you pull the lever and you get exactly what you bargained for. No, listen, he's God in heaven and he does as he pleases. And he works many times in a way that says, you're not going to settle me down into any kind of formula where you can figure me out. You're going to have to trust me each step of the way. But notice, this man walked away healed. Now, if you notice the last phrase of verse 9, did you notice? That day was the Sabbath. All of this was done on the Sabbath. And this is going to be the whole source of the controversy that follows. And this begins, the part of the Gospel of John, focused on the opposition against Jesus. This is really a lead-in. The rest of John chapter 5 is about how Jesus was opposed by the religious authorities. Why? Friends, he was opposed because he healed somebody on the Sabbath day. You know, there's a saying that some people use, and it's kind of a cynical statement, but sometimes it seems true. No good deed goes unpunished. And it kind of seems like that with Jesus right now, isn't it? Why did all this opposition begin, at least as John lays it out in his gospel? It begins because Jesus did something good. But as Jesus did something good, he deliberately confronted the religious establishment. Jesus was not going to kowtow or bow down before the religious traditions of men. He's going to confront it. And in that confrontation, it's going to show the religious leaders among the Jewish people at that time at their worst. And it's going to show Jesus Christ at his best. But this is what I want you to understand, is all of this opposition is going to work to carry out God's eternal plan. Friends, there's a big lesson written for us throughout the theme of this next section of the Gospel of John. And the big theme is simply this. God uses opposition against us. If you thought that being a follower of Jesus Christ would mean that you follow, you know, this great uh, uh, road lined with wildflowers on each side and there's just angels singing every step of the way, you will be opposed. But here's the great lesson of God in the midst of it. God will even use that opposition against you for his glory and for your good. Now, 
We'll get more into that this next week. But I want to leave this particular text of John chapter 5 thinking about something else. I want you to think about just for a moment how Jesus chose this one man out of the perhaps hundreds of people who were gathered there around the pool of Bethesda that day. Now, you could think about this. Was it that Jesus only cared about that one man and didn't care about anybody else? Well, I don't think that's it. This is what I really notice in this. As Jesus is there in the midst of that crowd, nobody recognizes him Nobody calls out to him. How that scene at the pool of Bethesda could have been way different if people would have called out to Jesus and said, Jesus, Son of God, heal me. Jesus, Son of God, would you please meet my need? Nobody did that at the pool of Bethesda. Jesus came in as if nobody noticed him, and that's why he only approached one particular man. You see, friends, there was a multitude of needy people there, but none of them looked to Jesus. And I fully believe that the power of Jesus was there to heal any one of them, but they all ignored Jesus. Why? Because they were staring at the water. They are so intent to see when the water might be stirred so that they could jump in first, so that whether it was a fact or whether it was a superstition, they were staring at the water and nobody looked at Jesus. They were so focused upon their way that they never saw the true way. Verse 4 says that they were all gathered around the water waiting for it to be stirred so that they could be healed. You know what's tragic? There's a lot of people today who wait to receive something that Jesus has to give them right here, right now. They're waiting. But because their eyes aren't upon Jesus Christ, they're waiting, but they're not looking in the right place. You see, they should have been looking to Jesus. And people wait today. They wait for a more convenient season to live their life for God. They wait for a dream or a vision. They wait for a sign or a wonder. They wait to be compelled. They wait for some great move of the work of God. They wait for some particular feeling within themselves. They wait for some celebrity to show them the way. Friends, don't wait for any of that. Jesus is before you right now to speak to your life and to meet your need. No more waiting at the pool of Bethesda. If Jesus is in your midst, you reach out to him now with the eye and the hand of faith. And you say, Jesus, would you meet my need now? Father, that's my prayer. I pray that um, we would not be like that multitude waiting around the pool of Bethesda, so conscious of our need, but not looking to the Savior to meet that need. Father, I just pray that you'd move among people now who've been waiting a long time. Lord, I don't know how you want to meet their need. Maybe you want to meet it in a way that they never thought was possible. Maybe you want to meet that need for love, meet that need for relationship, meet that need for security, meet that need for significance. Lord, do you want to do it all that way? You want to meet that need in a way that they never, ever thought was possible. Lord, would you please show them that Jesus is here now today to do that. And we just want to say, Jesus, you have complete freedom in our life to shake it up and to do it in a way that we never expected you to do it. You are our God. And now we bow before you and we ask you to do that work in our life, we pray in Jesus' name.